Hi, I am Dr. Malescu and I am an assistant professor at Daytona State College and I am here to instruct you on the endocrine system. So let's begin. Let me move the thumbnail so that I'm here on the side. The first thing I want to talk about is the um, endocrine glands versus exocrine glands. So endocrine glands do not have a duct so that the hormones are directly released out of the gland into the bloodstream. These hormones affect either other glands or other organs uh, creating the effect that they are supposed to create. So for example, you can have um, a hormone in the anterior pituitary gland, which we will go over, that uh, gets into the bloodstream and then affects our gonads, meaning the sex glands. So if it's an ovary or uh, the testes, it will affect that. And then the testes will release testosterone the ovary will release estrogen and it'll have a specific effect on the body. Okay, so that's what an endocrine gland does. Now an exocrine gland, on the other hand, is um, considered to be a gland that you will see in the uh, digestive system. So for example, um, a special gland that is both endocrine and exocrine is the pancreas. The pancreas can be an endocrine gland releasing hormones like insulin and glucagon, which we are going to go over in detail. But it also releases as an exocrine gland. So it has a duct to release uh, specific uh, products that are going to assist in digestion. But it'll also release specific products such as hormones that will have an effect on the endocrine system. So insulin in particular, when you're full and you have plenty of glucose in the blood, it'll um, the pancreas will release insulin and the insulin will mobilize the glucose to it into the bloodstream and to the cell membrane so that the insulin will assist in absorption of that glucose into the cells so that all the cells have energy. Now on the other, on the same flip side, if you're hungry and you don't have enough sugar in your blood, so your blood glucose goes below 50 and your brain is not functioning, your glucagon hormone will be released by the pancreas and it'll go straight to um, the liver and from the liver uh, the liver will break down um, and metabolize uh, glycogen into glucose molecules which will then go into the bloodstream and eventually reach the brain so now all of a sudden now you're not going to pass out because you have enough uh, blood glucose so that's an example of what uh, an endocrine gland does and what it can do. So the pancreas can be both an endocrine gland and an exocrine gland. So let's continue. All right. Now let me move my thumbnail again. So as I'm narrating this, if I get up and show you specific things, I will. Otherwise, um, this is a PowerPoint that um, you can access in your shell, but I am now narrating it for future um, just because we are now virtual due to COVID-19. So I want to make sure um, you get extra, extra instruction. All right, so the general characteristics of the endocrine system. Unlike the nervous system, endocrine glands take their time. They release their hormones into the bloodstream to specific target cell uh, receptors. And the receptors will receive this particular hormone at its own rate and allow the hormone to enter the cell. Now, very different than what you see, for example, in the nervous system. The nervous system will release the neurotransmitters via exocytosis from the um, synaptic vesicles, cross over the uh, synaptic side, the synaptic cleft, and reach the postsynaptic side called the postsynaptic uh, cell. And that moves much, much, much faster 
than the endocrine gland. So just wanted to show you the general characteristics of an endocrine system that um, is a slower kind of movement versus the uh, nervous system reaction. Next slide. Sorry. There we go. It's a little bit slow. All right, so the endocrine system consists of all of these glands. So we can see here the first gland here is called the pineal gland. The pineal gland is affiliated with um, the function of the sleep-wake cycle. The pineal gland releases a hormone called melatonin and it regulates and it is based on the stimuli of light energy coming in so that during the day you are more awake during the night you are not so the pineal gland is affected by light energy now the melatonin is going to regulate the ups and downs of melatonin production based on the light or darkness okay or the lack of light and so this regulates your sleep wake cycle so that in the evening you start to get less active versus in the daytime now of course there's other people like me I like to lecture and teach at night because I am definitely more active at night it all depends perhaps it's all those years of residency and medical school all right so that's the pineal gland now we move on the next uh, gland that you see here is called the hypothalamus and it is a section that we learned in AMP1 um, it is in the brain and the hypothalamus is the great regulator he is the he or she I like to <laughs> create a gender but it is a structure that controls everyone else so if you had a company this would be the CEO um, chief executive officer because it has releasing hormones I put the finger quotes because um, the hormones that it releases okay has the name releasing in it because that hormone dictates to the pituitary gland what to release the pituitary gland releases a hormone which in turn has an effect on all these other glands so let me elaborate you can have adrenocorticotropin releasing hormone that comes from the hypothalamus which then tells the anterior pituitary portion of the pituitary gland to release adrenocorticotropic hormone ACTH that hormone in turn goes into the bloodstream and eventually hits the adrenal gland right here the ACTH the adrenocorticotropic hormone will eventually reach the cortex of the adrenal gland and the adrenal gland will release specific mineralocorticoids specifically cortisol which deals with chronic stress so if you have chronic stress your hypothalamus is the great detector of this it is like the thermostat alert alert we need to auto regulate and that's what the body does so I just gave you one hormone one example but as we go through this PowerPoint you will be learning quite a lot of these hormones and what they do all right so below that you see the pituitary gland and as I mentioned there's an anterior pituitary gland you will be learning several anti anterior pituitary glands um, and you will learn their functions now in addition to to the anterior pituitary gland there's also the posterior pituitary gland and there are only two hormones that you need to memorize there but not just memorize but understand the functions ADH and oxytocin we will go over what those hormones are in a minute as soon as we get to those slides now I'm just doing a superficial cursory review of all the glands that you need to learn about 
Below that distally, we move on now to the thyroid gland. Behind the thyroid gland are two tiny, um, two superior glands and two inferior glands for a total of four, and they they are posterior or behind the thyroid gland. So the parathyroid glands, there are four little tiny seed glands behind the thyroid gland. So the thyroid gland and the parathyroid gland are involved in re regulating quite a lot. For example, the thyroid gland regulates your metabolism. The thyroid gland also releases calcitonin when you have plenty of calcium in the blood. And the release of calcitonin will mobilize that excess calcium um, and cause osteoblastic activity, building of bone, and storing the bone as calcium phosphate. Now, behind or posterior to the thyroid gland, we have the parathyroid glands which release parathyroid hormone, and that happens when the blood calcium levels are low. As you know, blood calcium, calcium is involved in muscle contraction. You need a certain level of blood calcium always circulating. Otherwise, we're in big trouble. We need calcium for muscle contraction, including the heart. So as soon as that happens, as soon as we have hypocalcemia in the blood, the parathyroid gland kicks into action, releases parathyroid hormone, PTH, which then mobilizes the calcium stored in the bone, calcium phosphate, and uh, osteoclastic activity occurs, meaning the osteoclasts break down bone and release the calcium into the bloodstream. So that's everything you need to know about the parathyroid gland. Then you have the uh, thymus. The thymus is involved in immune system um, maturing the T cells, and the thymus is really large as an infant, so it's designed to keep the infant alive as the immune system starts to get exposed to different viruses and different bacteria, so they build their immune system and, of course, get their immunity, their IgG, their immunoglobulin from the mother if the mother is breastfeeding. So the thymus releases what's called thymosine, which is going to stimulate the maturation of the T cells. As you get older, the thymus gland diminishes in size, and how sad is this? As you become geriatric, 65 and up, it turns to fat, and this is why older people have a poor immune system as compared to someone who is young. And now we know that more than ever, that anyone who is over 50... Um, starts to, you know, basically starting at 50, but definitely by 60, 65, your immune system is tanking, um, not uh, peaking, but definitely tanking. So that's enough about the thymus. I move on to the adrenal gland. The adrenal gland has a cortex, the outer shell, which is involved in the release of cortisol when it comes to management of chronic stress. At the center of it all is the um, is the medulla, the adrenal medulla. And in the adrenal medulla, it's the fight or flight response with two types of adrenaline called epinephrine and norepinephrine. So that's everything you need to know about the adrenal gland. So I'm giving you the highlights, the cliff note version of all the glands in the endocrine system, and then I'll keep moving with the PowerPoint going into different slides delineating more detail about all these glands. Now, next is the pancreas, and I showed you in the first slide um, all the information you needed to know about the pancreas. The pancreas is an amazing gland because it's the only gland in the endocrine system that is both an endocrine as well as an exocrine. When we go over uh, digestive system, you will be learning more about the digestive process of the pancreas. For this lecture, we are talking about simply the endocrine gland uh, function of the pancreas, which I mentioned the insulin release and the glucon re glucagon release. In addition to that, there's one other um, hormone, it's called somatostatin. Somatostatin controls or limits or limitation of growth hormone. It limits growth hormone. All right, so those are the three hormones found in the pancreas. 
Next, we have the gonads. The gonads are the sex glands. So we have the ovary and the testes. If you are a female, the ovary releases estrogen. If you are a male, the testes that's housed in the scrotum uh, releases testosterone. The ovary also releases an egg ovulation once a month, day 14. The testes are always producing, mass producing the sperm, spermatogenesis, and we will be going over that um, as soon as we do reproductive. All right, let's move to the next slide. And here I am showing you a baby, a very cute little baby here. And this infant, um, I wanted to show you how large their thymus is. This proves that um, an infant is pretty much set to live. It is designed as such so that it can survive uh, due to the barrage of viruses and bacteria that it has not yet been exposed to. All right, let me keep going. Sometimes. There we go. Now, the next thing I want to show you, oops, I went back too far forward. The next thing I want to show you is the thymus um, as it relates to all the organs around it. So here it is. The thymus, uh, let me just fix this and bring this up there. Hopefully you could see this better. There it is, the thymus. I just, I'm a little bit picky about making sure you see everything in the screen. Okay, so the thymus plays a role in three systems, endocrine, lymphatic, and immune. So it plays a huge role. Uh, it is a bilobed gland that uh, is found in the mediastinum. The mediastinum are all the structures superior to the heart and posterior to it. Um, the thymus gland is the site of maturation for the T cells, as I mentioned before, and it secretes the hormones uh, thymopoietin, thymosine, and thymulin. For purposes of this lesson, just remember the mature um, hormone is called thymosine, and that is what stimulates um, the development of the other lymphatic organs and the activity of the lymphocytes, specifically the T lymphocytes. All right, let's keep going. All right, so in this image, we are looking at the pituitary gland and the hypothalamus. Extremely important structures. This is where it's all happening. The hypothalamus, seen here in yellow, is the location of very specific releasing hormones that control and regulate the, uh, the um, release of hormones from the anterior pituitary and the posterior pituitary. Here's the lengthy stalk and here's the pituitary gland. It kind of looks like um, an onion stalk. Now, hopefully you remember your AMP1, but just remember, remember this was the thalamus right here and this is the hypothalamus. Remember that the pituitary gland sat in the cella turcica, that inside portion uh, of the skull, interior skull, and it was the body of the bat. Remember the cella turcica was the body and then the wings were this, the sphenoid, the greater sphenoid and lesser sphenoid. So hopefully you're not traumatized, but hopefully you still remember <laughs> a and P1. But that's a little flash from the past about the pituitary gland sitting in the cella turcica. All right, let's keep going. Now, in this PowerPoint slide, let me move the thumbnail again. We are reviewing every single gland in detail. The first gland that I want to go over is the pineal gland. As I mentioned before, it secretes melatonin. It regulates the circadian rhythms. 
Um, the thymus gland, as I said, these are just, it's highlighted and outlined for you so you remember. The thymus gland secretes thymosines. It promotes the development of certain uh, lymphocytes, specifically the T lymphocytes, and it is important in the role of immunity. The endocrine glands that are also reproductive organs are the ovaries because you can consider it as a gland because it does release a specific hormone called estrogen and progesterone and of course the testes release testosterone and I also want to mention that additionally we have a placenta when we are pregnant that is the only time that you have a placenta and the placenta is very specific um, this is the housing for the growing fetus, and it produces estrogens, progesterone, and gonadotropic, human chorionic gonadotropin hormone. And that HCG, human chorionic gonadotropin hormone, um, increases as there's fetal growth. All right, and there are other organs that are involved that are can be considered somewhat endocrine glands, such as specific digestive glands, for example, our pancreas. The heart has some involvement as well as the kidney. All right, let's keep going. Now, more detail about the pineal gland. The pineal gland, after age seven, it undergoes involution or shrinkage. It shrinks to about 75% of its original size by the end of puberty. It's a tiny mass of shrunken tissue in adults. What does this pineal gland do? It, it, it is involved in the 24-hour circadian rhythm of daylight and darkness. It synthesizes melatonin from serotonin or serotonin, however you want to pronounce that, during the nighttime. This is why you need your rest because you need to regulate your melatonin. It does fluctuate seasonally with changes in the length of the day. It may regulate also, by the way, the timing of when the puberty um, phase occurs in humans. And it is uh, suspected that the pineal gland is involved in seasonal affective disorder, SAD. And literally, we are sad in the winter and especially in the northern climates because we never see the sun. We need the sun. We are beings that synthesize um, our chemical on our skin to activate our vitamin D. And all of that can only happen with sun rays hitting us. This is why we need vitamin D because we're not getting enough sun. And the symptoms of seasonal affective disorder can be carbohydrate craving, that's why people gain weight in the winter, depression, sleepiness, irritability, um, just simple two hours or three hours of bright light. You can do UV light lamp, okay, will reduce the melatonin um, issue uh, and, and symptoms. So we call that phototherapy. All right, let's keep going. Come on. All right, so here we see direct gene activation of lipid-soluble hormones. What you see is the extracellular fluid outside of the cell. Here's a steroid hormone. It crosses the cell membrane. Here's the receptor hormone complex. Okay, and now it's going to, check this out, it's going to enter, but you have a receptor here, and it's and the receptor is going to either allow it in or not. It allowed it in, and this is at the uh, DNA level, so we know that this is in the nucleoplasm, and so what we're seeing here is the mRNA uh, transcribing and creating the synthesis of a new protein, which basically you learned about protein synthesis in AMP1. So you see the steroid hormone diffuses through the plasma membrane, binds to the intracellular receptor. The receptor hormone complex enters the nucleus. The receptor hormone complex binds to a specific region of the DNA. Then the binding will initiate transcription of that gene. The mRNA does that, gets the message, 
sends it out for translation in the cytoplasm and we now have a new protein so we will have that new steroid hormone working for us and our body is an amazing machine this happens constantly all right and am I still recording looks like I am yes okay just want to make sure because I'm narrating this PowerPoint so let's go on to the next one okay so the types of endocrine stimuli we have humoral stimulus neural stimulus and hormonal stimulus humoral stimulus basically involves um, the hormone being released and caused by altered levels of certain critical ions or nutrients in the body so lack of homeostasis so it can be detected like for example I gave you the issue with the thyroid gland when there's low calcium if there's low calcium levels in the bloodstream then the thyroid gland will come to action and release um, I'm sorry the parathyroid gland will come to action and release parathyroid hormone now if your blood levels of calcium are high then the thyroid gland is going to release calcitonin and take that calcium and mobilize it and store it in the form of calcium phosphate so that we build bone the strength of bone with that calcium all right so again all of this is detected either based on high calcium meaning calcitonin thyroid gland releasing calcitonin or low calcium and this is what you see here low calcium the parathyroid gland kicks in and releases parathyroid hormone in this case we have the neural stimulus and in the neural stimulus what we are looking at is the fact that the nervous system is reacting to an outside stimuli stress massive amounts of chronic stress okay and that's going to eventually cause the hypothalamus to release the releasing hormone adrenocorticotropin releasing hormone and that adrenocorticotropin releasing hormone goes to the antipituitary to release the adrenocorticotropic hormone ACTH and ACTH released from the antipituitary eventually causes the adrenal gland the cortisol to be released from the adrenal gland and so that is chronic stress now in the case of neural stimulation what you see here is we bypass all of that we don't see the cortisol effect and it's not a humoral control or hormonal stimulus okay so in this case with the adrenal cortex this is a hormonal stimulus directly by the hypothalamus and I talked about the adrenal corticotropin uh, releasing hormone and then the ACTH the adrenal corticotropic hormone which then gets released and has an effect on the adrenal cortex that's all humoral stimulus as opposed to and in comparison to the medulla this is not chronic stress this is you see a bear or a wolf in front of you and you do what fight or flight you run like hell you're scared out of your mind epinephrine release from the ad adrenal gland the medulla is the core the medulla is the center of the adrenal gland and massive amounts of adrenaline is released norepinephrine and epinephrine into the capillaries into the arteries causing massive effects like superhuman strength to run heart rate goes up uh, respiratory rate goes up all of that okay so this is an important concept physiological concept to remember so please don't forget humoral stimulus neural stimulus hormonal stimulus hormonal stimulus I gave you the example of the adrenal cortex all being controlled by the hypothalamus adrenal corticotropin horm releasing hormone which then causes the anterior pituitary to release ACTH adrenal corticotropic hormone which then causes the adrenal cortex to release cortisol and manage chronic stress the other examples you see here is the thyroid gland 
uh, releasing uh, calcitonin, or T3, T4, which regulates your metabolism. If it's calcitonin, you have plenty of uh, calcium in the blood, and that would be the humoral stimulus. In the hormonal stimulus, we're not talking about calcitonin. With the thyroid gland in the hormonal stimulus, we're talking about T3, T4. Uh, thyroxine is the metabolite. T3 is the uh, n not the mature version of the hormone. Thyroxine has all four iodines uh, involved. Those are the molecules iodine. And so T4 or thyroxine is what regulates your metabolism. If you don't have enough thyroxine, you have hypothyroidism and you metabolize food slowly so you gain weight. If you're hyper too high, then you have hyperthyroidism. We're going to go over that very soon in these slides. In this case, the hormonal stimulus to the gonads is going to be, again, gonadotropin-releasing hormone from the hypothalamus, which then stimulates the production of FSH and LH. FSH is follicle-stimulating hormone. LH is luteinizing hormone. These two hormones are going to have influence on the testes. More to come as I move with the slides. You'll see when I talk about FSH and LH. So let's carry on because I still have quite a lot of work to talk about. We're 31 minutes in and I have 68 slides. All right, let me move the thumbnail over. And here you can see the anterior pituitary uh, gland is going to have a negative feedback. If we have plenty of hormones that are released from the anterior pituitary gland, if we have plenty, we, um, we pretty much in the bloodstream, all that excess hormone is going to tell the hypothalamus to stop releasing the releasing hormones and diminish production. All right, now in addition, the anterior pituitary releases a lot of this hormone, which causes other endocrine glands peripherally to release their hormone. So their hormone, in turn, will go back to both the anterior pituitary and the hypothalamus to diminish production. So that's called negative feedback. So what you are looking at here is negative feedback. Positive feedback is stimulation. All right, the next slide. Antipituitary hormones, there's a lot of them, so we're going to go over that in a minute. What you see here is that the antipituitary is obviously very large and anterior. The posterior pituitary is smaller and posterior. There's only two hormones that are released by the posterior pituitary, and they are ADH and oxytocin. We will go over that in a minute. And the anterior pituitary has uh, several hormones that we will be going over as well. We have a huge capillary bed, uh, both arterial and venous, and this is where there's a lot of exchange. Capillaries are exchange vessels, so this is where all the hormones are released and gets into the bloodstream. It gets to where we need to get to. All right, do you have any issues with this? I hope not. I think this slide is very clear. Let's keep going. So, the pituitary, the pituitary gland secretions um, have an influence on many parts of the body, as you can see here. This is a really good slide because it shows you that the antipituitary releases all of this. So you have to memorize these names and and then you have to understand, not just memorize, what it does. So the anterior pituitary releases growth hormone, which has a direct effect on bone. The anterior pituitary releases adrenocorticotropic hormone, ACTH, which is again directly linked to the hypothalamus releasing and stimulating the production of ACTH. What is it releasing? What is the hypothalamus releasing? Adrenocorticotropin-releasing hormone. 
and that is causing ACTH to be released, which then goes in the blood and causes the adrenal cortex to release cortisol. What else? We went over GH, growth hormone. We went over ACTH. The next one is TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone. Again, TSH is controlled by the hypothalamus because the hypothalamus releases the thyrotropin releasing hormone and the thyrotropin releasing hormone stimulates the release of TSH which then goes into the bloodstream and causes the thyroid gland to release thyroxine and um, stimulate your metabolism. All right now going over here we can see that the anterior pituitary is also releasing gonadotropin horm gonadotropic hormones, FSH and LH. FSH stands for follicle stimulating hormone. LH stands for luteinizing hormone. FSH, think of it as a follicle, is like an, uh, a nest. Follicle stimulating hormone stimulates the production of sperm. If you're a male, fo FSH or follicle stimulating hormone stimulates the production of the egg so that ovulation could take place. LH on the other hand also released by the anterior pituitary stimulates the testes to release testosterone and cause the secondary male sexual characteristics such as excess hair growth, thicker bone, um, beard and you know all that. And um, LH in the female stimulates the production of the breasts and wider hips and things like that. Okay, what else? The anterior pituitary also stimulates um, the production of, of, of milk from the mammary gland. So how does that happen? The anterior pituitary gland releases prolactin. It releases prolactin. Why? Because the hypothalamus releases a releasing hormone. All right. And so that releasing hormone stimulates prolactin, which then stimulates the mammary glands to release milk. Now, there is a posterior pituitary gland, and this posterior pituitary gland only has two hormones that it releases. One other interesting fact. All these hormones are released by the anterior pituitary. All these two hormones are released by the posterior pituitary. But... These ADH and oxytocin is made, is synthesized in the hypothalamus, okay, but stored in the posterior pituitary gland. It's stored for when it is needed. ADH is only stored when you need to reabsorb fluid. Lack of ADH causes you to urinate more. Antidiuretic, a diuretic makes you pee. Okay, so um, there are water pills, okay, that are, are taken orally when you have high blood pressure. Well, it's like a hose. If you want to diminish the pressure, get rid of the volume. So how do you get rid of the volume? Well, less blood volume means that you need to urinate some of that fluid out. So that's why we give... Uh, hypertensive patients a diuretic. Now antidiuretic means that you urinate less and reabsorb the uh, fluid. The volume goes up, the blood pressure goes up. When you drink coffee and alcohol it inhibits ADH and this is why it is a diuretic. And if it's a diuretic you're gonna pee it out more. All right, so that's ADH. Now this is oxytocin. Oxytocin is going to stimulate the uterine um, smooth muscle to contract, so obviously it stimulates labor and delivery. It also stimulates the milk let out, not the consistent um, milk production because that's your prolactin over here and that's involved with the anterior pituitary. But when you first give birth to the infant, the mammary glands are all set up because oxytocin not only causes labor and delivery, but also the letdown of milk from the mammary glands. Now, another interesting thing about oxytocin is I like to call it the stupid love hormone because it causes you to fall in love. 
also it's not just your own child but your your mate when you first meet someone and you are in love it's the effect of oxytocin which definitely wears down after six months and then you see the person for truly who they are so that's oxytocin but oxytocin also helps in the nurturing and the bonding between a mother and child so oxytocin also helps the um, bond increase it's a hormone all right so let's move on next slide Posterior pituitary hormone, as I said, this is a review. The old name, we don't use this term anymore. It's called vasopressin. That's ADH, uh, antidiuretic hormone, and, of course, oxytocin. The nerve fibers originate in the hypothalamus. The Structurally, structurally we con it consists of nerve fibers and neuroglia. Those are the support nerve cells glandular epithelial cells of the anterior pituitary gland. So it is kind of communicating both with anterior pituitary and the hypothalamus. All right, let's go on to the next slide. So in this slide, you can see that oxytocin, um, you got a visual chart here, what it exactly does. It's stimulated by impulses from the hypothalamic neurons in response to cervical uterine stretching and suckling of the infant at the breast. How is it inhibited? Lack of neural stimuli. So if you stop breastfeeding, the production goes down eventually to nothing. ADH, as I said, the old name is called vasopressin. All right, it's stimulated by hypothalamic neurons in response to increased blood solute concentration or decreased blood volume. Also stimulated by pain, some drugs, and low blood pressure. Inhibition by adequate hydration of the body and by alcohol. So alcohol inhibits ADH big time. And so does, co so does coffee. Coffee, if you drink lots of coffee, you're going to urinate more. It inhibits ADH. Next slide, growth hormone. You can see here growth hormone is stimulated by the hormone in the hypothalamus called GnRH or GHRH, gonad uh, growth hormone releasing hormone, G GHRH. All right, so GHRH is released from the hypothalamus, which then stimulates GH to be released from the anterior pituitary, which is involved in growth of organs, bone. Um, if you have too little, you have dwarfism. If you have too much growth hormone, you have gigantism. And acromegaly is the term for enlarged hands and feet. All right, I'm going to keep going. So here we see a table. This is all from um, the Pearson book um, showing the hormone, the regulation of release, the target, uh, organ, and then, of course, the effects. So um, I'm not going to start into going too much detail, but Let's just give you the highlights. So thyroid stimulating hormone is released by the anterior pituitary. All right, so we know that it's stimulated by thy uh, TRH, thyrotropin releasing hormone. And of course it is inhibited through negative feedback if there's plenty of thyroxine. Uh, both the pituitary gland and the thyroid gland will diminish production at the hypothalamic level and the pituitary level. Thyroid gland, of course, once it's stimulated, is going to release the thyroid hormones. If you have enough thyroxine, um, you're normal. If you have too much, you have hyperthyroidism. If you have too little, um, it's called hypothyroidism. The other name for it is called myxedema. If you are born with it as a child, the child is um, mentally challenged. And crétin in French, C-R-E-T-I-N, means idiot, not very politically correct. And this word is a very outdated term. We shouldn't even use it anymore. Cretinism, which means 
it means what it means because in French, crétin, I took eight years of French, uh, means idiot. So it just means that the child is born with severe uh, mental retardation. All right. Adrenocorticotropic hormone, ACTH. This is um, stimulated by CRH, which basically is the hormone coming out of the hypothalamus, uh, cortisol releasing hormone, and cortisol, uh, corticotropin releasing hormone, pardon me, is going to stimulate ACTH. How is it inhibited? By negative feedback. Too many glucocorticoids like cortisol, the production will go down. The adrenal cortex is what produces these mineralocorticoids. Um, short for that, we just say cortisol. All right. Too little, and we it's rare. We never have too little. But too little, that's a problem. Too much, we have what's called Cushing's disease. And... Um, there's a specific body type that is associated with Cushing's. It has the truncal obesity, the buffalo hump, which is basically scapular fat. Um, and you'll see when we get to that section of the PowerPoint slides. Follicle stimulating hormone, it's stimulated by gonadotropic releasing hormone in the hypothalamus, but it is inhibited by inhibin and estrogens in females, testosterone in males. Okay. Um, Again, the target organ is the ovaries and the testes. Now, what happens if it's not working? Well, failure of sexual maturation. If it's too high, no important effects other than being quite fertile <laughs> and virile, <laughs> right? Okay, LH is going to stimulate, uh, is stimulated by GnRH, uh, but is inhibited by... Um, excess um, estrogen and progesterone in females, and if you're male, it's testosterone, negative feedback. All right, and it's this, this whole thing, LH works the same as FSH. Um, it's just failure of maturation, all right, because LH had to do with testosterone production and estrogen production. FSH had to do with production of the sperm or the egg, all right? So you're just not going to go through puberty. It's just failure of sexual maturation. And, of course, if you have little uh, or low FSH, um, that's a problem because low FSH is going to lower your production of testosterone, which causes impotence, oh, not impotence, sorry, uh, infertility. Impotence is the inability to um, cause the penis to become erect. So uh, infertility on the male's part is the fact that there's not enough production either of the FSH, which stimulates the, the spermatogenesis uh, and formation of mature sperm, or... LH, meaning there's not enough testosterone and there's just not enough development in puberty. And then as an adult, maybe, you know, you've, you just don't have a developed um, gonad, testes. All right, moving on, we have the prolactin. Prolactin is stimulated by uh, PIH. Um, and if it's stimulated, you're going to uh, cause the breast to lactate. It is inhibited by PIH, prolactin inhibiting hormone, um, and this is what happens when the baby is no longer breastfeeding. All right, either poor milk production or the mom is just no longer needed. The infant is no longer uh, wanting to breastfeed. All right, let's keep going. So, in essence, I want you to literally look at this slide and have it imprinted in your brain because this is the mother load right here. If you remember nothing else, this is the slide to remember because this lists it all. So, the first one is GHRH, growth hormone releasing hormone, which causes the growth hormone to mature bone, muscle, adipose tissue. Negative feedback. 
it comes back and somatostatin is what stops the growth hormone okay that's what somatostatin does it stops the release of growth hormone and this is also found in the hypothalamus where else is it found it is also found as i mentioned in the beginning of this lecture it is also found in the pancreas pancreas as an endocrine gland releases three hormones insulin glucagon and somatostatin now the next one is prolactin it is controlled by prf or pih prf is prolactin releasing factor pih is prolactin releasing inhibiting hormone so this is a mouthful to remember I would stick with memorizing and remembering the anterior pituitary um, hormones. These releasing hormones are all part of the hypothalamus. So PRL is prolactin. Negative feedback is basically if you have enough prolactin and enough milk, it's going to diminish production. So less production of uh, PRF. All right, moving on. TRH, thyrotropin releasing hormone, stimulates TSH, which then stimulates the thyroid gland to release thyroxine. All right. And again, there's negative feedback. If you've got plenty of thyroxine, TSH production diminishes and TRH production diminishes. Negative feedback. Then the next one here is corticotropin releasing hormone, which then stimulates um, the production of ACTH, adrenocorticotropic hormone, which then in turn stimulates the adrenal gland to release um, mineralocorticoids, specifically cortisol. And yes, if you've ever taken cortisone cream or prednisone, it is a synthetic prednisone, it is a synthetic version of cortisol that is part of our body releasing this particular hormone. Now, GnRH is an extremely important hormone. Gonadotropin releasing hormone. This is where you either are fertile or infertile as a male or female because GnRH is the hypothalamus. It's supposed to stimulate the production of LH and FSH. LH is going to stimulate the production of estrogen and progesterone in the ovary. LH is supposed to increase the production of testosterone hormone in the testes. FSH, in turn, is supposed to stimulate the production of the egg once a month during ovulation. FSH in the male is supposed to stimulate the production of sperm. And there you have it. That's what is seen here. You need to remember one, two, three, four, five, six anterior pituitary hormones. How many posterior pituitary hormones? Only two. The two posterior pituitary hormones are seen in the next slide. Uh, I think. No. The Let me go back. I believe I had it previously. It was ADH and oxytocin. Um, let me go back, back, back. I'm going to go back just a few slides to show you. Right here, posterior pituitary was ADH and oxytocin, okay? All right, moving forward again. Let's keep going. In this slide, we are learning uh, about the... Um, control of calcium. This is extremely important, so let's do it. So the thyroid gland and the parathyroid gland are the major players. Let me move my thumbnail here. So um, if your PTH is released, that is the situation where you have low blood calcium. So low bloodstream calcium is the situation where the parathyroid gland is going to release PTH. PTH in turn will cause the breakdown of uh, bone to release calcium and now calcium is released into the bloodstream. That's what you see here. Additionally, the PTH is also, not only is it, is it um, in the bloodstream now, 
okay? But it is also influencing as it's moving through the bloodstream, it's also influencing the kidneys. And the kidneys at this point in turn, because of the influence of PTH, is going to conserve as much calcium as possible, as well as activating the vitamin D. And the vitamin D, once it's activated, um, it flows through the bloodstream and reaches the intestines, which then absorbs some of that calcium that comes in uh, through your food. And, of course, it goes through the bloodstream. And so now you have plenty of calcium. There's negative feedback. Diminish the production of PTH. And that's basically the positive feedback and the negative feedback on controlling the calcium in the blood. Because remember, you always have to have a certain level of calcium in the blood to stay healthy and uh, contracting your muscles. All right, let's go to the next slide. So <clears throat> the chemistry of the hormones, you can have hormones that are steroid-like such as the sex steroids or the adrenal cortex hormones. And then we have non-steroid hormones such as amines, proteins, peptides, and glycoproteins. Let's keep going. Uh, the next slide. Here we talk about hormonal secretions, control of the hormonal secretions, as I mentioned before. Um, it is controlled by negative feedback mechanism. Hormones can be short-lived or may last for days. Hormone secretions are precise, precisely regulated. Unused hormones can be dumped in the urine. It is excreted in the urine. All right, uh, this is a flow chart that shows you how it all works. Um, this is deep physiology here, really showing you every single effect. From the hypothalamus, the effect of, in this case, growth hormone from the antipituitary. It's uh, indirect feedback that how it can inhibit the GHRH and the GH synthesis and release. Okay? And you can see indirect actions on the liver, direct actions on fat metabolism, carbohydrate metabolism. The liver and other tissues are also involved in insulin-like growth factors that will affect the growth of the skeleton, increased cartilage formation and skeletal growth, extraskeletal uh, production, such as increased protein synthesis and cell growth. Fat metabolism is the direct metabolic action. So, you know, growth hormone is extremely important throughout your life. Don't think that it's just simply uh, during puberty. It will occur throughout the lifespan to maintain organs. So here we have someone with high growth hormone levels, so too much growth hormone, and you have gigantism, too little, and you have dwarfism. The woman is average height. All right, so this just shows you the negative feedback. Hypothalamus, all right, releasing TRH, thyroid releasing hormone, which then causes the antipituitary to release TSH, which in turn causes the uh, thyroid gland to release thyroxine to the target cells and metabolize. And then, as you can see, there's always inhibition, negative feedback, either from here at the thyroid gland level, releasing the thyroxine, or up the flow chart from the anterior pituitary, uh, influencing the hypothalamus to diminish production of TRH. All right, let's keep going. Now, the thyroid gland, its location, it has two lobes, just the larynx. And as mentioned before, T4 is called thyroxine. This is the primary active hormone. T3 is not the active. It will be converted at the target organ uh, once it reaches there. Calcitonin is the hormone that is released only and only when calcium is 
pretty much elevated in the bloodstream maybe had two gallons of milk i doubt it but that calcitonin is released to mobilize the calcium to the bone so that you can store that calcium in the form of calcium phosphate and your bones are nice and strong all right let's keep going so far we're at 59 minutes so this slide shows you the thyroid gland and its location. As you can see, it's right below the thyroid cartilage. This here is the trachea. Um, look at the tissue level microscopically, and you can see that it's uh, colloid-filled follicles. And um, these are the areas where we secrete the thyroid hormone, the follicular cells. So the follicular cells, in particular, in the thyroid gland is what releases the thyroid hormone. All right, moving on. So posterior aspect of the thyroid gland, this is what you're going to see here, the little yellow seed glands are called the parathyroid glands. These only are activated when calcium is low in the blood. When calcium is high in the blood, it's the release of calcitonin from the thyroid gland. When the blood calcium is low in the blood, then PTH is released or parathyroid hormone is released from the parathyroid gland. Let's keep going. So this is the feedback loop. As you can see here, you've got high blood calcium. Perhaps you had a gallon of milk. Calcitonin is released by the thyroid gland. Breakdown of bone matrix decreases. Calcium leaves in the blood. It decreases. And how does it do that? Because calcitonin is involved and it stores the blood as calcium phosphate. On the other hand, flip side, low calcium causes the release of parathyroid gland, causes the breakdown of the bone matrix, and now calcium levels in the blood rises, and we go back to homeostasis, back to balance, back to normal blood calcium levels. All right, in this slide, you can see even better the thyroid gland, and this is a cadaveric view of the thyroid gland. So um, there it is. Um, I'll just keep going. This is what's called an endemic goiter. And when you have thyroid issues, this is what happens. This is a very exaggerated version. I don't know how anyone could let this get so out of hand before finally going in and getting it surgically excised. Wow. All right, so let's keep going. I put that slide up for <laughs> dramatic effect. All right, now, I'm not going to belabor this point because there's a lot of information here. But um, if you want to look up, uh, there's plenty of uh, charts out there that cause, uh, that uh, illustrate the system that's affected by the hormones shows you the normal physiological effects, the abnormal too low or too high. So let's start reviewing what you need to know. Um, bottom line is the synthesis of thyroid hormone is based and, fu and fundamentally based on the idea that you have enough iodine in your blood. So you can see that this is what's happening. Protein synthesis can only occur if there's iodine in the blood. So obviously I'm going to go right to the next slide and tell you that if you do not have iodine in your diet, you will get a goiter. Okay, now bulging eyes on the other hand is hyperthyroidism. Okay, and we call the term bulging eyes, it's called exothalamus. And hyperthyroidism is called Graves disease if it's an autoimmune issue. And it's just basically the immune system has kicked in and is attacking the thyroid gland. And um, basically you've got hypersecretion of the uh, thyroxine. Um, hyposecretion is myxedema. All right. 
So these are the parathyroid glands. There's your thyroid gland. So this is a histological sample showing you what it looks like. All right. Now, the effects of parathyroid on the bone, kidneys, and intestine. Here it is. Hypocalcemia. I know we went over this, but I'm going to go over it again. Too little blood, too little calcium in the blood. Your PTH is released. It causes osteoclastic activity. Clast means to break chaos of society. K C, C, right? So osteoclastic activity is breakdown of bone. And when we break down bone, we have calcium in the blood. The increased calcium reabsorption in the kidney also will bring more calcium in the blood. The increase of activated vitamin D is going to cause the calcium reabsorption in the gut, all because of your kidney. All right, let's keep going. So this is just another view showing how your kidney um, and your adrenal glands are involved so much um, in the endocrine system. So we talked about the kidney. Um, now we're going to talk about the cortex and the medulla of the adrenal gland. So we have different layers. The outermost layer is zona glomerulosa, zona fasciculata, zona reticularis, and the adrenal medulla. All you need to remember is that the cortex is where you release the mineralocorticosteroids, the cortisol, and the medulla is where you release epinephrine and norepinephrine. So this is just a view. So you can see um, this is superior, this is inferior, and you're looking at a kidney. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that you can see that superiorly above the kidney, this is the adrenal gland. All right, so again, the adrenal gland, so important. You've got the capsule, and you've got the cortex, and then the center is the medulla that releases norepinephrine and epinephrine. Cortex releases the mineralocorticosteroids. Steroids are any numerous naturally occurring synthetic soluble organic compounds with 17 carbon atoms. Um, they have either anabolic effects, meaning buildup, anti-inflammatory effect, and unfortunately it causes fat deposition. That's why stress can make you fat. Chronic stress will make you fat. So cortisol and corticosteroids are basically um, steroids that will um, help reduce inflammation. We can take aspirin, ibuprofen, and, and Celebrex and things like that. These are non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. I just wanted to add that in there so you know how our um, medications, our drugs mimic what the body already produces. So the adrenal glands are closely associated, as I mentioned before, with the kidneys. It sits like a cap on top of the kidney. The hormones are secreted from the two different areas. The cortex is the mineralocorticosteroids, and then, of course, the adrenal medulla releasing the norepinephrine and epinephrine. So there it is. Um, this is just um, injected dye, so you can see the tissue better. The, seen there in hot pink, those are the adrenal glands sitting on top of the kidneys. All right, here's your capsules, zona glomerulosa, zona fasciculata, zona reticularis. I don't hold you responsible for all of that. Just remember that that's the adrenal cortex. And then the adrenal medulla is speaks for itself. It's the core, it's the center of the adrenal gland. Now, this is what Cushing's looks like. Cushing's is basically... Uh, excess cortisol secretion, hyperglycemia, hypertension, weakness, edema. You tend to be obese, rapid muscle and bone loss due to protein catabolism, meaning protein breakdown. Abnormal fat deposition, you have a moon face, such as seen in this boy. And you have uh, what's called a buffalo hump, which is scapula fat in between the scapula. Take a look at problems with Cushing's, someone before Cushing's, and someone with Cushing's. All right, someone after treatment will have a nice neck, and then take a look at this uh, area here. That's usually an association with also a buffalo uh, hump or back fat, and usually that tells you that there's an issue with 
excess cortisol. So if you have a lot of stress, you're going to start to look like this. So don't have stress. <laughs> Easier said than done. All right, so the mineralocorticoids are the other hormones called aldosterone. The glucocorticoids are basically the cortisol, for example, causing Cushing's disease. The opposite of Cushing's is Addison. So too little glucocorticoids or too little cortisol and you have Addison's. Gonadocorticoids are basically stimulated by ACTH and unfortunately um, if you're female and your gonadocorticoids are located at the adrenal cortex and you have a tumor there, it's going to cause excess production of hair and masculinization of the, ma of the female. All right, as, as I said with the adrenal uh, medullary area, you have catecholamines. These are the adrenaline hormones such as epinephrine and norepinephrine. It is the fight or flight hormone. All right, so short-term stress, epinephrine, adrenal medulla. Long-term stress, cortisol, adrenal cortex. Adrenal corticotropic hormone is released by the uh, anterior pituitary, causing the adrenal cortex to release the glucocorticoids or cortisol. And look what it does to you. Nothing good comes out of release of glucocorticoids. First of all, the proteins and the fats are converted to glucose. So keep doing that and you become diabetic because the body's eventually going to shut down and you'll become insulin resistant. And the blood glucose increases and the immune system is suppressed. Now, additionally, the mineralocorticoids are going to cause the kidneys to retain sodium and water. Blood volume goes up. Now you have high blood pressure. None of this is good for you. All right. Now the pancreas, as you can see here, sits below the liver, um, but behind the stomach, you have the small intestine and you have the gallbladder. Just so you know situationally where the pancreas is. The pancreas has two major types of secretory tissue. You have <clears throat> um, three hormones in the area, like I said, you have glucagon, you have insulin, and you have somatostatin. The cells that produce these hormones are alpha cells produce glucagon, beta cells produce insulin, delta cells produce somatostatin. All right, this is what the issue of the pancreas looks like under the microscope. I'll just keep going. Now, let's talk about diabetes because uh, over 40% of the population is overweight and some have diabetes. It is very common. So there's the diabetes that's adult onset and then there's the uh, diabetes that juvenile onset. The juvenile onset is usually an autoimmune reaction from a viral incident in childhood that has caused the immune system to turn against the human and destroy the beta cells in the pancreas and now all of a sudden there's no production of insulin. So that's juvenile onset diabetes. Now the diabetes that is more common is the adult onset diabetes and basically the symptoms are polyuria, excess urine output, polydipsia, intense thirst, polyphagia, intense hunger. This is caused by chronic elevation of blood glucose because you have become insulin resistant. And insulin resistance can only occur if you've followed a very bad diet or you've not been exercising or all of it, combined sedentary lifestyle. And um, being overweight puts you at risk for non-insulin dependent diabetes uh, adult onset. Eventually, if even the uh, medications, if the oral medications don't work, you can end up and convert to an insulin-dependent diabetic. So in this case, let's take a peek. We have the pancreas releasing insulin. When does that happen? When there's enough food and we need to get the glucose, the blood glucose back down a normal range. Okay, now let's say 
if we don't have enough blood glucose, okay, if the blood glucose levels are low, let's say your blood glucose levels are under 50 because you're hypoglycemic for whatever reason, you haven't eaten for, I don't know, 12 hours, your pancreas from the alpha cells will release glucagon. Glucagon goes to the liver. The liver will break down the glycogen into glucose. Now all of a sudden you have free glucose molecules in the bloodstream and voila, homeostasis. Your bloodstream will go back to normal blood glucose levels so that your brain, which cannot be starved of glucose, can still function until your next meal. So this is what your body does for you if you're fasting, for example. When you're fasting, glucagon is released in order to uh, mobilize the stored glucose in the liver. And that stored glucose is what we call glycogen. All right, let's keep going. We're almost at the end. So let's discuss now type 1 diabetes versus type 2. So as I said, type 1 diabetes uh, is juvenile onset diabetes. Uh, can you be a type 1 as an adult? Sure, that's the one issue. For example, if you have been a poorly controlled diabetic with oral medications, you can convert from a non-insulin diabetic to an insulin, di uh, insulin dependent diabetic. However, when we talk about juvenile onset, typically they are type 1 insulin dependent. Why? Because as mentioned, a viral illness in childhood is um, suspected to be the cause of the beta cells destro being destroyed through autoimmunity, your immune system turns against you and destroys the beta cells, which in turn now causes lack of insulin production. There's no insulin production. You cannot mobilize the glucose to the cells because there's no insulin. The insulin receptors need the insulin. All right, so what do you do? Exogenous insulin injection. You can start with insulin injections, go to the insulin uh, pump, and now we even have the dry insulin inhaler. Uh, we need to monitor blood glucose levels and a very nicely controlled diet. Um, there is a hereditary susceptibility. And of course, as mentioned, certain viruses like cytomegalovirus, uh, rubella, are all uh, causes, uh, suspected causes of um, type 1 juvenile onset diabetes. So obviously, I'm going to tell you, don't be the anti-vaxxer, get vaccinated, get the rubella vaccine uh, for your children. Okay, now, next, autoantibodies will attack and destroy these beta cells, and this results in permanent damage. This child will be a type 1 juvenile onset diabetic. All right, so that was that, and now we go to type 2. Type 2 is 90 to 95% of the diabetics that you see or hear about, all right, uh, or know about family and friends, right? Non-insulin dependent diabetes, this is a problem due to being overweight, being, um, being of a specific age, usually 40 and up. Uh, risk factors can be hereditary. Uh, definitely obesity is one of the main causes. Ethnicity as well. Um, specific diets from specific ethnicities don't help either. So um, it's been proven that Native American, Hispanic, and Asian diets are not helpful and may cause um, this whole issue, type 2 diabetes. Basically, it's failure of the target cells to respond to insulin, so it's insulin resistance. How do we treat it? Well, number one is a weight loss program and exercise program. Um, number two is oral medications to improve the insulin secretion or target cell sensitivity. And that's pretty much how you manage diabetes type 2. All right. Now, in this image here, this is a histological tissue sample of the pancreatic islet showing you the alpha glucagon producing cells and the beta uh, cells producing the insulin. And in between, you have the exocrine cells, which we're not going to talk about because that'll be when we talk about the digestive system and the pancreatic role in that. 
This is a flow chart showing you how much insulin affects everything. It affects all tissues. Amazingly, it affects everything. The liver, the skeletal muscle. All right, look, if you don't have enough insulin, you're, if you've seen diabetics that are uh, poorly controlled, they have muscle atrophy, okay? Um, there's a lot that happens, so I'm not going to belabor this point because I just wanted to introduce you to the basic uh, idea of what uh, insulin does to the body. So let me keep going. So the pathology of diabetes, basically the cells cannot absorb the glucose and must rely on fat and proteins for energy needs. So initially before you get diagnosed as a diabetic, you'll actually have weight loss and weakness. The fat catabolism increases the free fatty acids and produces ketones in the blood and eventually you can spill it out in the urine. Um, you'll have a fruity breath odor and as well as your urine uh, will have a, f a fruit, fruit, fruity smell to it. Um, if this is getting out of control and you never get treated for it, for it the ketoacidosis um, is very dangerous um, and may result in a diabetic coma. All right, let's keep going. So uh, chronic hyperglycemia can eventually lead to neuropathy, which is nerve damage. We learned in AMP1 about the myelin sheath that increases the uh, nerve, the um, action potential or the nerve impulse because the action potential travels along the nodes, travels along the nodes of Ranvier. Um, so the myelin sheath is a protective layer along the axon and initiates the nerve impulse to travel faster. So in diabetic neuropathy, the nerve impulse does not travel as fast or even at all. And so that leads to numbness and tingling. The stocking glove distribution, your hands and feet and digits are numb. Uh, in addition, you have cardiovascular damage causing an increase in atherosclerosis and microvascular damage. So these are all the complications of diabetes. All right. You can even have diabetic um, retinopathy, and that's a huge issue and may cause blindness. These are the diabetic complications. This is an image of the lower extremity. This is the lower leg. Um, this is all due to poor circulation. This is really, really bad gangrene. Uh, unfortunately, this is dry gangrene. That means that it's already dead. There's no blood supply. And when you see black like this, it means that that tissue is gone. It's dead. There's nothing, there's no live cells there. So they're going to lose that toe. All right. So this is just a chart showing you all the different uh, ways, a source, uh, a hormone source, the actual hormone, the chemical composition, the trigger, and the target organ and effect. I'm going to skip through this because we want to get through this uh, presentation uh, in a timely matter because we are now at an hour and 22 minutes. So I'll skip this. Now, the final um, discussion here. We have a few slides left. Stress kills. So I'd like to talk about this because this is um, very important. The survival depends on maintaining homeostasis. We need to be stressed out so that we can react to our internal environment and external environment, okay? So loss of homeostasis basically is stress. Now, chronic stress is going to make you release all those cortisols, which are so bad. The cortisol hormone causes um, hyperglycemia, a chronic state of hyperglycemia, um, and it increases the mineral mineralocorticoids and that is a problem because that's going to increase your blood volume okay and in turn cause high blood pressure so high blood pressure diabetes heart disease all of it is related to chronic stress and so 
I end with this. I end this presentation with this book recommendation, The Cortisol Connection Diet. All right, so if you want to lower your cortisol levels, you must lower your stress levels. Okay, so it's very simple. It is the stress fact. Okay, all right, so I do hope you enjoyed this presentation on the endocrine system. And if you have any questions, you can email me and we can discuss. Take care. Bye.